Hey folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So here I am filming some videos and I thought, oh, I haven't done any five questions with Matt Easton for a long time. Uh, so I've just posted on the Facebook page. If you're not on the Facebook page, then go and like us on Facebook, please. Um, uh, link below. And I've just posted on there going that I'm filming it now. So people are now putting in their questions on the Facebook page and I will pick off any that come up that I think are cool enough, interesting enough or funny enough. Um, so the questions are being posted below. Let's go and have a look and see what the next, what the first question is. So the first question that's come up from Jackson Firebird, awesome name, um, is what would I do tomorrow if, uh, if the UK government tomorrow banned anything to do with weapons and the owning of any sorts of swords or anything like this kind of stuff. Obviously the things that I collect and, and the things that I make videos about. Well, the first thing I would do is emigrate. There we go. So uh, I'm sorry, UK government or UK, you can screw yourselves if you do that. I'm off. I'm off to America or Canada or maybe New Zealand. I don't know. Yeah, so basically I'm out of here. But my uh, job doesn't rely on, my main job in fact is, uh, is an office job. So this isn't my main job making videos or teaching fencing or whatever, but I have to say there is no way on earth I'd want to live in a country that banned things like martial arts or fencing or antique sword collecting. Gone. Bye. No loyalty. Patriot patriotism in the bin. You don't deserve me. I'm off. So that's the answer to the first question. So second question, Dylan Pestle Clark, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, asks to what extent does uh, has bone uh, limited or other organic materials limited the damage done by weapons? Well, the answer is yeah, quite a bit. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about hand weapons or firearms or arrows or anything else. Absolutely bone can deflect, can stop um, the, the travel of certain things. And um, there, are, there are cases from history of um, heads, for example, uh, breaking sword blades. In fact, I, I've recounted this many times in previous videos, but I own the sword of a British officer who broke his first sword. So the sword I own is the replacement. The first sword he broke on the head of a Russian officer um, during the Crimean War. So uh, heads can break blades uh, or de certainly deflect them sometimes. I've seen rather grim photos of someone who was attacked by a tiger, um, bitten around the head a lot and the tiger, um, whilst it did put lots of indentations in his head, um, the bone protected him from that tiger's bites. I mean obviously a tiger's teeth aren't a weapon potentially, uh, um, literally, but um, Nevertheless, you get the point. So absolutely, bone is a hard substance. One thing I would throw in though, is that bone isn't as um, as hard as most people think of it because most people's exposure to bone is cooked bone and cooked bone is much harder um, than, uh, than living bone or freshly killed bone. Um, and I have done some test cutting on a freshly killed carcass and um, the sword went through the bone more easily than I expected. Uh, it had a relatively little um, ability to, uh, to to stop the path of a sharp sword. Um, I would liken it to something like wood that's been soaked for a while. Um, so anyway, so there we go. So bone can deflect things. Obviously it's uh, stronger or harder than, uh, than flesh and muscle and things like this, but it's maybe not as hard as you think of cooked bone. Like if you get a bone for, um, uh, you know, in your, in your food, for example, or indeed if you buy a large cow bone for your dog to chew from the pet store, um, that's, that will be harder because it's been dead for a long time, it's calcified and this kind of stuff. So living bone is softer. So Steve Dandy asks, what's my favorite historical film and why? Well, when I first read that, I thought, oh my God, that's so difficult because there are so many historical films that I absolutely love. Um, but you know what? My probably my favorite film of all time, just of any film, happens to be a historical film and it is Lawrence of Arabia, um, set during World War I about T.E. Lawrence uh, and the so-called Arab Revolt fighting against the Ottoman Turks. And um, that is my favorite film of all time. So I would have to say, Lawrence of Arabia, but there are many other historical movies that I absolutely love. Um, I love The Sand Pebbles, I love um, uh, the, man, uh, the Man Who Would Be King, uh, Zulu of course, um, uh, there's absolutely tons uh, and, and there's lots of films which are quasi-historical um, that I also quite enjoy as well. Even, I, I, even films that aren't very historically accurate, I might still like them as films. Um, and, you know, I have to give a shout out to The Duelists as well from an artistic point of view. The Duelists set during the Napoleonic Wars 
it not only has good sword, of fight sword fighting in it, but Ridley Scott's first big motion picture, and it is a, a great film. But anyway, the basic answer to the question is Lawrence of Arabia, and if you haven't seen it, my God, go and watch it. I mean, it's very much of its time, it was made in the 60s, but it's still a really great film. So Jack Chilton, this is my fourth question, Jack Chilton asks a really interesting question actually, I don't think I've ever been asked this before. If I was asked to choreograph or advise for a fight in a movie um, that was supposed to be both historical and entertaining, the fight, what period or what weapons would I choose to tick those boxes to make it both exciting to watch and also historically accurate-ish? Well, first of all, I'd have to say I'm not an expert in all styles and all periods, so I might just recommend them to go to someone else. Uh, but based on my knowledge of, uh, of fencing systems and fighting systems from different places and different times, I would say that uh, rapier and dagger has to be up there. Um, okay, so um, I, I think that, you know, a lot of people have asked me to review the fights in Alatrist, and I will do. Um, and I won't say uh, without going into that, I won't say whether they're accurate or not, but I would say that Rapier and Dagger has the potential to look absolutely freaking awesome on screen if it's well choreographed and well shot. And a lot of that is about shooting angles and camera angles, as well as training the actors to be able to do the moves well. And, you know, Viggo Mortensen is, moves very well, whether he's in Lord of the Rings or Alatrist or whatever, uh, even Hidalgo, he looks right when he's moving. He's got a good physicality. Uh, he's even obviously a good horseman as well. Um, so Rapier and Dagger has to be up there. I'd also say Sword and Buckler has the potential to look incredible. Sword and Buckler done well. And that could be any style. It could be Indian Tulwa and Dal or it could be um, it could be European medieval Sword and Buckler uh, or Bolognese sort of Renaissance um, Sword and Buckler, side Sword and Buckler. Um, so Sword and Buckler could look amazing. Um, I have to say I like it, some of the fighting in Troy. So I think that Large Shield and uh, uh, large Shield and Sword has the potential to look partic particularly good. Unfortunately, I don't think that Large Shield and Spear, I, I, can't, I don't think you can make it look very exciting for the screen. And they tried with Troy, and I think they kind of took it about as far as you can plausibly take it. And I wouldn't say that it was necessarily historical at all. Um, but, uh, you know, dagger fighting, knife fighting can look awesome, and it can look historical uh, or kind of realistic, and it can look awesome as well. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps great sword fighting, uh, you know, Spodone, Montantes, Vihander, whatever you want to call it, but a big two-handed sword, if that was done well with a lot of variation within the fight, because there's a lot you can do with a big two-hander. Obviously, you, it's a massive, impressive weapon. The only downside and the reason they might avoid them in movies is because they don't move very fast. Um, they're not slow, but they don't move as fast as lighter shorter, quicker weapons do. Um, but nevertheless, there's a lot you can do with them. You can use them a bit like a pole arm, you can use them one-handed, particularly with thrusting, you use the pommels, you can half-sword with them, all kinds of stuff you can do with them. So that could look awesome. Basically, there's a wealth of options, and I'd love to see more historical techniques making it into historical movies. Right, the final question at least for this video, but thank you for all of your questions because I can see I have absolutely loads there, many of which will probably make it into future videos. But Chris Ball asks, were big two-handed swords, so the Montante Spadones of Ihanda, were they used um, at more as bludgeoning weapons or as cutting weapons? And that this seems to be a, tro a trope, particularly a movie trope, uh, perhaps even role-playing game trope, that, that won't die. Um, Short answer, short, simple answer, no, they were definitely cutting weapons and they were definitely sharp. Every historical source that we have and every reference to them and mention of them and the historical surviving examples are sharp. They are designed to cut. And if you look at something like the Highland Claymore, for example, which is a form of great sword, a form of two-handed sword, they, uh, they actually have quite thin blades. Um, so very often those giant two-handed swords are lighter than you would imagine. My example is overweight. Mine is eight pounds, but a lot of historical examples are between five and seven pounds. Um, Mine is probably at least a pound overweight for the type of sword it is, um, which obviously makes it more heroic that I wielded it one-handed on that video. But anyway, um, so, um, so no, they were absolutely meant to be sharp cutting weapons and every reference to them refers to them cutting things, cutting, you know, uh, uh, cutting through horses, 
uh, chopping off pike heads that that kind of thing will, that will never die and there is a historical image at least showing that implying it in Morozzo from 1536 so no absolutely they were sharp cutting weapons and particularly in the Renaissance when they were being used so in the 16th century these big two-handed swords weren't having to deal with armor so much anymore because there were there were greater numbers of less armored troops now on the battlefield bigger armies less armor more guns more pikes and therefore two-handed swords against cavalry against horses and against other infantry um, on foot were more potent because of course there were less people wearing uh, wearing less encompassing armor than there had been in the 15th century so very much cutting swords thank you again for all of your questions i'm going to go through these because there's some other really really good questions in there and i'll see you for the next video cheers folks thanks for watching please subscribe we have extra videos on patreon and you can follow us on facebook